saw a werewolf with a Chinese menu in his hand. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the view of Wolfpack Research or any of its officers. The views and opinions expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on this program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. We are not investment advisors. We hold no registrations with the SEC, FINRA, or any other regulatory agency, and none of the opinions expressed on this podcast should be considered investment advice. The listener should assume that we have positions in and stand to benefit from any stock or other security mentioned on this podcast. Do your own research before making investment decisions. Welcome to the Wolf Den, everybody. I'm Dan David. Thanks for joining us again. The pack is with us. And by pack, I mean Carl, our sound engineer. God help us all. This is going to be our typical, you know, faux pas Carl day. But to get through this, we have a pro. We have Corey Johnson with us. Corey Johnson is an entrepreneur like we have not spoken to before. Corey is the host of the Daily Drill Down podcast and the founder of the Business Podcast Network. My aspiration. Corey's career has seen him in prominent roles in technology as a journalist, broadcaster, hedge fund portfolio manager, and investor. But fundamentally, Corey's an entrepreneur, in case you couldn't tell from that intro. Helping start companies such as The Industry Standard, Slam, the world's largest basketball magazine, and Vibe. He was CNBC's first Silicon Valley correspondent and helped create TV, radio, and podcasts for Bloomberg. Also worked as a managing member of Epistrophe Capital and a senior executive at a Bitcoin startup called Ripple. I think you might have heard of that. And several others. So, Corey, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I want to thank the whole Wolf Pack. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Well, we, we, we don't we don't have any sound effects that are wolves howling or anything. I mean not yet. But uh, we'll work on it. No. Yeah. Uh, put it on the list, Carl. That is now now in pencil. So we will is, not be one upped, Corey. It is almost we almost will, perfect. We will not be made fun of. <laughs> so Corey, I've listened to your shows. Your show's great, and we want to get back to the business podcast network and what you're doing with the drill down. I did your show. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, log rolling in our time. I'll do yours. You'll do mine. It's great. Oh, God. If I had a dime for every time I heard that. <laughs> and then I look at your career. And Keep it clean. You've done it. Uh, now, if I had a dime for every time I heard that. <laughs> you have done so much in your career. And I want to talk about the drill down, but I want to, I want to drill down on Corey, too, because nobody really ever talks about what you've done and where you started. Going back to college, you're at NYU, and you had kind of a different kind of study there, kind of an independent study where you did your own thing, and tell us about it. You know, I, I was having a long talk with my daughter about this this last week because we were doing some college tours, and uh, <laughs> when someone says independent study, you're like, oh, wow, you couldn't hack the real one, and that, <laughs> there's certainly some of that is true, but I initially went to college as a music business major, so I was studying. Well, I got in as a, on a guitar-playing scholarship, playing jazz guitar, but I studied uh, music, the actual music industry was a major in the uh, the school that I was in at NYU, the college I was in at NYU. And as I worked a little bit, interned in the music industry, worked gigs in Manhattan as a guitar player, I realized I didn't want to either when I grew up that some people wanted to practice even more than I did, that, you know, seven, eight hours a day wasn't going to yeah. cut it. And I wanted more out of life. And I also worked in the music industry and I found, my God, these people are bad musicians and bad business people. That's not what I want to do. But I'd already done so much of my, um, my major. So I'd I wanted to tack on some other majors and other colleges at the university. So yeah, I created a major that was, I studied uh, city planning, metropolitan studies it was called, and music business. And then as I neared the end of my four years in great terror of life afterwards, I tacked on a third major in a fifth year studying journalism. So I graduated from NYU studying music business, metropolitan studies, and journalism, um, and kind of proceeded to spend what I thought was going to be a life purely in journalism, um, covering sports and crime those are kind of my initial major focuses and until kind i started the writing thing. for new york magazine <laughs> well wall street yeah sports and crime intersections uh, well then wall street what let's throw that one you know the the perfect intersection of all the sports <laughs> crime yeah. crime yeah yeah you get it all there right that's fantastic so i was writing some kind of wall street culture pieces for new york magazine when another new york magazine columnist named jim kramer started to call me up with ideas of starting this website, which I've heard of uh, ultimately became thestreet.com. And I was the founding reporter of thestreet.com. 
uh, the website was Jim's idea and a great one. And it's, uh, you know, give Jim some credit. The street.com continues to this day. And how many 1996.coms are still with us? Not many. Yeah. The street.com came out when like Prodigy was was the email server. I mean, the email uh, of the choice, provider, right? Yeah, yeah. Provider Prodigy was real. CompuServe was real. Yeah. AOL was real. You got yeah. We well. used to. Well, AOL we started was kind of real. They were committing fraud, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, there was a there was financial architecture there that yeah. was unique. Yeah. It was a capitalization of a marketing expense. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, for, uh huh. We can get into that if you want to. But uh, we started the street.com. The first office was on the second floor of two Rector Street, uh, kind of right behind Trinity Church and Wall Street. You know, two blocks from the New York Stock Exchange, and indeed in the same block as the the a place once known as the American Stock Exchange. The building's mm-hmm. now for rent. Yeah, <laughs> I walked by there last week. Um, but uh, we had a a two phone cords that we would pass around when anyone wanted to get their computer logged on to the internet. No. Shut up. So yeah, so it was it was it was and it was even better. It was in a bank vault. So yeah. it was actually a vault for securities. There was a time when people would have to physically hand over the certificates for what had been traded yeah. on one of the exchanges mm-hmm. that day. I think Susquehanna was based in that building. I don't know if this was originally a Susquehanna office on the second floor, but we would go into this vault and there was a, you know, a cage from which paperwork could be handed back and forth. Stock search. And there was a and there were just a few of us working there. Uh, Jamie Heller, who's still with the Wall Street Journal, Alex Berenson, who now writes uh, crime novels, uh, yeah, yeah, or yeah. spy novels, I should say, mm-hmm. a great journalist uh, in his day. And um, uh, there, God, there was about two or three other people. And we would pa- Andrew Drake was the CEO of the street.com then. We would pass around the phone cord if someone had to log into the internet. Oh, um, my God. That, that's insane. You do. Yeah. This was early internet days. I mean, I was there. And what was Kramer's role? Did he just kind of was he there every day? I mean, talk to us about the early days. No, he was he was meant to be. You know, he certainly was his idea. He was the inspiration, but he was meant to be arm's length. And we were at that time trying to figure out an architecture to let him run his hedge fund so it wouldn't influence the serious journalism that we aspired to do. Yeah, it was, it was the erection of a Chinese wall. The, the erection of a Chinese wall. I see. Kind of like the investment bank analysts have with the banking side. They have like that Chinese firewall, which is really just a fern, maybe a kind of a palm tree yeah, yes, between yeah, them. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A curtain. Yeah, not even. So Kramer wasn't there on a day-to-day basis. He was running his hedge fund. And he was very successful there, too. He was there in spirit. He was filing copy like crazy. He would write two or three pieces a day or even more, sometimes six, seven, eight pieces a day. Wow. Right. We would, when we published the, uh, eventually I became a columnist. Well, that was kind of the initial role. And uh, our our new columns were represented uh, with little floating heads. So we had like little silhouettes of our heads and the Kramer would have a new floating head every few hours when he would write a new piece. It was a, it was a, it was a steady flow. It was a fire hose. Do you, do you remember the first piece you wrote for them or? You know, I don't. Uh, at a certain point, though, I was really writing color pieces about Wall Street. So I was writing about, the, you know, the, the thing that really inspired me was I knew. So at the time, I was living with a woman who was a, a specialist in the New York Stock Exchange. So I had a lot of stories about what really went on on the trading floor. And there were things, you know, for example, there were these, you know, uh, right wing, rabid anti communists on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I would say even what few people are still there probably still say all oh, those political views. But they were perfectly willing to buy illegal Cuban cigars out of a car parked behind the <laughs> sure. exchange. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, and so, you know, it was this. It was an interesting uh, cultural scene. Um, uh, yeah, I wrote pieces about the, you know, the kids who'd suddenly make a little bit of money and want to get the walk in with their French cuffs and want to get their shoes shined and right. and nails done and get their hair cut real short and the whole Gordon you know, Gecko vibe, right? Hundred percent. I wrote about the guys who stood in front of the New York Stock Exchange selling sandwiches and who had the best food around there. I think the piece that really put the street.com on the map uh, initially in a certain way uh, was an atypical piece. At the time, uh, Howard Stern had a movie out and, yeah. and he had all these private actors parts. Portraying, portraying his friends and stuff, right, private parts. And I think there was even talk of a Beavis and Butthead movie and what celebrities are going to play those roles. So I, I wrote a, a column I had to write two or three columns a week, you got to write something. Yeah. And I cast all of the um, uh, anchors and reporters on CNBC and what famous uh, actor might portray them. <laughs> and those who had said nice things about CNBC, or about, I'm sorry, those ni- CNBC people who had said nice things about the street.com got very favorable casting notes. Yeah. And so one moment on, uh, they're going to commercial break and Joe Kernan's tossing to Bill Griffith at Power Lunch and says, all right, and yeah, shares of IBM down uh, one time right off from IBM. 
back to you, Tom Cruise. And they cut to Bill Griffith and he loses it. And it's hard to get Bill Griffith to lose it. He's such a consummate <laughs> professional. And he loses it, starts cracking up. And then uh, and then he says something about cast throwing it back to, I don't know, Dennis Leary or whoever I cast that Joe Kernan as. And uh, they come back from break and they talk about the street.com. Our servers crashed. Really? And they crashed and they crashed again. We couldn't get up online. It was we had to get so much attention at that point. Um, and so we, it was a it was a moment in the street dot com that sort of accelerated our um, stature and, and attention. It was, uh, you know, it was a fun place. Did you get a Kramer call? Was he like, booyah? Kramer, uh, Kramer was not supposed to call the reporters. Uh, he was with oh, again, Chinese like ever? Chinese wall. Like ever to say like, hey, that was a nice article about like characters. 100%. Think really? of the conflict there. Right. OK. You write a positive article about Yahoo. And Kramer's got a big position. Okay. He says, great article. Yeah. You write a negative article about Yahoo. Kramer says, that story sucked. <laughs> okay. So that was, that was, that was what we're trying to avoid. Okay. Fair enough. And you do this, and I imagine you slammed a few people on CNBC. You maybe made a couple characters that they didn't like. And then you got a job Actually, on the, You want to know the funniest one? Yeah. There was a, there was a rumor at the time about, um, I'll just say there's a rumor at the time that Keanu Reeves uh, was gay. Whatever, who cares? Yeah. There was a reporter at CNBC who was in the closet whom I also knew to be gay. Yeah. And so I cast him as Keanu Reeves, then, you know, leading man in Hollywood. It was very much the inside joke that reporter has since come out. Uh, Keanu Reeves um, is, uh, is, is Keanu Reeves. He's one of the great actors of our time. Yeah. Um, but it was, a, there were some inside jokes in there. It was, it was good fun. Was it and, tense? You know, then, was it tense? Knew, Later, I ended up working at CNBC with so many of these people. I don't even know if they ever remembered that I was the one who wrote that story. But um, uh, it never came uh, up then. No, they were. I got to tell you, those people at CNBC are those people on the air are just awesome. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason that that channel people like that channel in spite of the content sometimes <laughs> because they're just really great people. Uh, to this day. Yeah. Well, actually, another. You know. I, th I think a, a quality of a really well-run company is keeping people around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And you look at people who are there and are still there. I mean, Joe Kernan, David yeah. Faber. I mean, they yeah. they have been there for probably 30 years. I think David Faber is really solid. I really do. He's a good guy, too. Yeah, 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 he is. I hear he is. Um, I, you know, I met him in passing, but he, and he seems to just be pretty dispassionate, good, solid work, and... I like the dry sense of humor. I think he plays well off Kramer and the whole thing. So when do we get to rip CNBC? We've been nice enough yet? I mean, look, I think people do enough of ripping of CNBC. I go on there every once in a while. I don't think that's really great for me to be ripping them. <laughs> uh, Can I rip them? I've, I've had a few tense moments on there as it is. Uh, so, but yeah, feel free. Let's get Let them. me tell you the problem with CNBC. Uh, tell me the problem. And I love CNBC. Yeah, And yeah. I love Managing editor Dan Calaruso, yeah. who's better than him. Yeah, you just say with all due respect, and then you can say all you want, and then it doesn't count. <laughs> that's the free. All due word. respect, Jane, you're an ignorant slut. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's, no, I that's, love that. that's that's from the good old days. Um, look, CNBC posits investing and trading as the same thing. Indeed, a CNBC story isn't a story unless it's buy, 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 sell, sell, sell. And you, it's uh, all business journalism, all business developments, all the interesting things happening in the world of business are not limited to buy, 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 sell, sell, sell. Indeed, if you focus only on buy, 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 sell, 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 you miss a lot. You miss context. You miss um, subterfuge. You miss interesting stories. If you reduce every story into a wiggly line, if you reduce every stock into a number, every company into a stock, you don't tell the human story. Every human life has dignity. Every person matters. And if you don't tell the story as a journalist about what a business does, and you can do that with a smaller staff, right? You can, if, if every company, if the banks, the industrials, the techs, the cryptos, what about gold? If it's all a wiggly line, you don't need a lot of reporters. You don't need a lot of editors who know anything. 
you can just reduce everything to wiggly land. There's a corporate incentive to make the news dumber when it comes to finance, but it does not respect human dignity and human intelligence. And it doesn't tell great stories. That's why I started the Business Podcast Network. That's what we do in the drill down every day. We try to tell the story of business. We try to talk about the companies that are trying to solve problems, the companies that are failing to solve those problems, the companies that aren't really trying and are actually frauds. We get into all that in the drill down every day for about a half an hour because I think that business journalism is more than just a price and a wiggly line and buy, 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 sell, sell, sell. Well, that's that's the drill down. And and I've, I've heard your show and you do a good job with that. But is is CNBC journalism? I don't I don't know that it is. I think they have a model that works for them. I don't know that it's actually journalism. I think at best they do postmortems on stories. This is what yeah, happened. Yeah, 100% looking back. It's hard, it's hard to do the look forwards. It's hard for me to do the look forwards. Look, we, we, this is something we deal with all the way, all the time with us when we see a stock move a lot and it's the news is already out there. It's too late. Yeah. But we really do try to look at the business story behind a stock that's on the move, and that's the story we try to tell every day. But I think that there's a lot more to journalism. The problem isn't just what CNBC does. CNBC is what CNBC is, but it has its imitators. And I'm not just talking about uh, Fox Business and, you know, um, uh, Cheddar and Yahoo Finance, you know, all doing live shots from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Are you kidding me? Has what place is more irrelevant right now, you know, or, or overrated for relevance more than that, right? No. Um, Corey, was it was that a change in in the the way they did their reporting, or did it evolve to that, or was it right out of the gate? It was always that way. So when CNBC launched in the '90s, there were some great great minds behind it, great TV guys, Bill Bolster. Um, Ted Shaker later on, um, some really terrific producers, people before I got there. And what they were trying to do was make business entertaining and put it on TV. Roger Ailes. Roger Ailes was the head of the whole thing. And they were trying to take something that wasn't visually interesting and make it visually interesting. And how do you do that? You take someone who's beautiful and smart like Maria Bartiromo and you put her around a bunch of men who are going to throw elbows at her because they don't want a woman down there and put the camera on her and see what happens. Why did they do it like that? Because they wanted to do Monday Night Football. And all of those guys would have quit that job in a second if they could have got the job to be producer of Monday Night Football. So they wanted to make business news look like Monday Night Football. They wanted to make it look entertaining. What did they not want to do? They weren't trying to give us good investment advice. They weren't trying to tell us better stories for our edification or for our eventual uh, savings and wealth and retirement. They were just trying to make the TV look pretty. And they weren't trying to be controversial. They weren't trying to get sued uh, or, you know, have companies not want to be on their program. They they, they want to have the CEOs there. All true. Um, yeah. But I, th I don't know if it was as uh, malicious or seditious as that. They were just trying to get along, to go along, to make popular TV, and they succeeded at that. The, the worst thing that has happened to me, though, is that it has infected, and that's the, that's the worst of CNBC. CNBC does better sometimes. But the worst thing that has happened is it's infected the rest of business journalism. That if you read the Wall Street Journal now about an IPO, you read about the banker, you read about the pricing structure, you read about the venture investments, you might get to paragraph 10 before you find out what the company does. And you'll get to paragraph 11 and they'll be back to talking about who the lawyers were. Yeah. You don't learn about business, you learn about trading. And the same thing has happened to Fortune magazine. The same thing has happened to the large degree of Forbes magazine. The new entrance into the world of media, they give us price. They, now that some of these stories are written by robots. You know, yeah. even IBD. IBD used to tell us about businesses. IBD is sort of largely gone, Investors Business Daily. Yeah. But it rarely tells us about the businesses when it, when it is there. It's um, what happens is we're not getting the human experience. If you meet someone at a cocktail party, what do you ask them? You ask them about themselves. What right. do you do for a living? Yeah, do. right. Right? Right. We talk about our business lives. We spend vast amount of times. I didn't want to leave the house this morning. I wanted to spend the time with my family, but I left the house to go to work. I spend my day at work. Um, most people are spending their days at work, and yet our journalism is treating their work as if it's a price. What a bore. What a, what a, who wants to, as a journalist, who wants to tell that story? I want to tell the stories about what people do and what products they're creating and what businesses they're trying to build. I, I can talk, I can do finance all day long, and I've done it cool. I'm going to tell stories. And I love that. Yeah. And it, it, it is not a problem with CNBC alone. It's a problem with journalism in general. Oh, business Grant, journalism. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it's why podcasting has become more popular because, you know, people like you can start their own network and say, look, this is what's missing and I'm going to fill the gap. 
and that's what you're doing. I, you know, I, I just can't watch the news anymore, whether it's politics or business. It just, you're just not getting the news. You're getting opinions and it's tough. And it doesn't matter whether it's CNBC or Bloomberg or, you know, Fox business, it's all kind of postmortem and squiggly lines as well. I mean, the most well, interesting- I think look, I think it's easier to um, tell stories in business without people looking for the bias if you tell the story of business. And that's the other reason I'm excited. Two things, right? So one thing is when you talk about business, people don't think, oh, that's what a liberal would say. Oh, he's saying that because he's a conservative, right? right. Oh, he's a, he's, a, he's a Trump guy, obviously, because he thinks the, the price is 31, not 30. No, there's numbers are numbers. Businesses are business. Success and failure can be measured in business, just like a Canada basketball game. Um, the other thing that's interesting, I think, is that podcasts really do lend themselves to a conversation. 74% of all podcast listeners we have found in studies, or I'm sorry, I read a study that says 74% of all podcast listeners expect to learn something new on a podcast. Well, they're listening to the wrong podcast. <laughs> but go ahead. Go ahead. So I'm sorry, listeners. Go ahead. You got the preach, wrong one. Teach. We're, we're glad to have the other 26% of you. Welcome to the Wolfpack. Yeah, pack. thank you. Um, Welcome. <laughs> I think that um, uh, this medium uh, lends itself well to description, right? What I mean, to me, there ain't nothing better than baseball and radio. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love listening to John Miller and the, and Dwayne Kuyper and, and Mike Kruko and Dave Fleming do the New York uh, San Francisco Giants broadcast. Um, now it seems like five or six days a week. It's, it's, we're having a great season, so maybe that's, I'm enjoying it even more. Baseball and radio is great. I think podcasts are great also because they lend themselves to storytelling. But I also think, separate point, that the reason podcasts have gravitated towards true crime and not business news is because it's an accident because no one's been able to do good business news because they're looking at CNBC as a model for storytelling and CNBC is a visual medium, not an audio medium. It's not a storytelling medium. It's a graphics medium. CNBC is better when it's got a cool stock chart and a beautiful Maria Bartiromo on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange or a, 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 you know, a, a, a authoritative Ted David behind the anchor chair. I realize that Ted and, and Maria are long gone from that network, but uh, I think they were they did that, that job as well as it could be done. Um, it's a visual medium. It's a medium that has is trying to do something different than tell stories and necessarily inform in depth. I think CNBC was its best when it did tell a story, and the story was you know, Ackman and Icon. Oh, uh, that yeah. was Isn't that a great moment. Oh my god, oh my god, it was fantastic. But that was like that was crossfire, right? That was that was that was two guys arguing. It was but two guys who knew what they're talking about. It was well, it was. I'm not clear. Icon knew what he's talking about in that conversation. <laughs> And yet he crammed it up his ass in the end. And he was wrong, in my opinion. I mean, like, I'm obviously Herbalife paid this huge fine for, for business practice. But if, you, if you're purely judging on the trade and who won and who lost, you would say that the guy who didn't really make any sense on that program and was just cursing everyone out, uh, Icon, won. What was his line? You're like the little boy in the playground. It didn't get what he liked. No, he was I grew up in uh, the Bronx yeah. or Brooklyn or whatever, you know, a, a Jewish kid that just beat the shit out of everybody and I had to beat you up. And you were just like, <laughs> wow, man, this guy, this guy's really going back. And uh, he really, went, I, I think if he'd have been there right then, he would have thrown a punch at, at Ackman. When in real life, it was East Hampton versus Bridgehampton. <laughs> yeah, if we're really, really going to talk about it. It really was. Uh, by the way. Carl Icahn, East Hampton, Bill Ackman, Bridgehampton. Right. It was like, listen, my butler would beat the shit out of your driver. <laughs> I, my boat is so much bigger than yours, I don't want to hear it. But Suck my we can name. use the Al Franken line. Uh, I was doing a fundraiser in, uh, I think it was Southampton. No, it might have been East Hampton. Rich Hampton. It was Rich Hampton. I was doing this fundraiser in Rich Hampton. Yeah. 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 Yeah, right. <laughs> I always I always love these guys like that, that do that, like even with Trump when he's like, you know, that, that, that he was a tough guy growing up. And I'm just, you know, like, yeah. when you and your brothers Please. were fighting, who won, the maid or the butler? I mean, Please. like, <laughs> you, give me a break. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not seeing it. But the spontaneous moments that aren't scripted. And I think you can get some of those in podcasts, too, where you're not you really could. getting I just, them. You know, that's not exactly what I'm trying to do. I mean, I, I, I get why that's entertaining and, and arguments. People definitely, um, 
you know, I'm from the East Coast, people that talk differently. People argue more readily yeah. and more confrontationally, and, and truth is revealed in those moments sometimes. But I think there's a lot, you know, let's talk, I want to talk to ask your opinion about this, um, about Herbalife, right? So there was a point at which Herbalife was no, to, in my mind, no longer a stock, it was an argument. Yeah. Right. It was no longer a business evaluation. It was an argument. It was a battle about short sellers. GameStop has be become the same thing. Uh, Tesla has certainly been that for a long time. Oh, yeah. It hasn't been a, a company that's whose uh, financial success is evaluated by the pr stock price. It's an argument between two groups. Right. But it, it, what do you do with those names? What do you do with those uh, uh, holdings in a, a stock portfolio? Do you run? Do you try to run the momentum? Do you try to get out of the way because it doesn't matter what the fundamentals are? First, I'll answer your first question. You talked about Herbalife, and I never got involved in Herbalife, either, no, either in a trade or in the fight. And I've not gotten involved in Tesla either, either in the trade or the fight, because it's like, what am I going to add that Jim Chanos isn't bringing to the table? Like, I'm just going to bring my little pea shooter. Uh, the guy's shooting howitzers. I mean, like, I'm not, I'm not adding anything. And with Herbalife, I had a guy that, that worked with me at the time. And some people might, might know him, Chris Irons, quote the Raven. And when, he, when I hired him, he, he said, look, I really hate this one company. And I, I really feel a mission to people to continue to fight this fight separately from geo investing my, my former company and let's be clear i think chris does really good work we haven't talked about this but i think he does i think he's a really good researcher and he really has a, a way of reading a document that 100 people have read and seeing the truth in there that other people have missed he's, he's got a lot of passion and he cares yeah. very much and you know whether people like him or hate him what he's telling you is the truth in his mind for sure and he's researched it if you disagree with him that's that's your opinion i generally don't disagree with what he's done and i didn't disagree with him on herbalife either i i felt like at, at certain times it, there can be a real redundancy to it just like with tesla if somebody shows me another burning tesla on the road okay you know th there are burning fords and general motors cars and whatever i mean get back to the fundamental conversation about profit and loss and and not whether that a car can get into a crash and I think you're taking away from the argument. I did a lot of um, early journalism on Tesla that was very critical of the company. And at the time I was friendly with Elon, um, you know, personally emails back and forth, took me on a ride in, early, in a, in a pre-Model S Tesla um, with a bunch of stories together, um, uh, or stories I would do about Tesla, I should say, and he would, helped us out with a SpaceX story once as well. But when I started being critical of the company, when I started pointing out that they weren't hitting their targets, yeah. when I started pointing out the changing accounting standards or the changing um, uh, reveals about certain metrics and so on, they cut me off. He cut me off. Solar the company, City. He blocked me on Twitter, whatever. Oh, yeah. And, I, and, I, and I'm still okay. Um, I pushed really hard on these stories until a lot of other people got involved, and I kind of got less interested in it. I will also say that Bloomberg actually took me off the story. Really? No. Quietly because they felt that I was overly critical of the company. Well, first of all, let me let me just point out that megalomaniacs tend to do that. They'll just, you know, when-, when You're referring to Elon, not my beloved ex-boss, Mike Bloomberg, who had nothing to do with this. I, I am referring to people like Elon, people like former Overstock critics. I mean, like a whole litany of people who like to be critical, but when you put it back on them, it's just like block, and then they want to put you on blast or whatever. It's it, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And all you're really doing is your job because you, whether you rode in a car with the great Elon Musk or not, you're still a journalist, and you're still trying to do your job. And and then I get what you want to you want to hear some criticism about about a network or journalism. Bloomberg bugs me sometimes with their journalism and their editors. I mean, there there's some bullshit going on there. <laughs> You're Bloomberg Print or Bloomberg TV? More print, actually, I oh, really? have found. I, you know, the television is just, you know, it's okay. I, you know, I mean, you know, wh whenever I do it, it's, you're never going to get surprised with an aha there, right? They're, they're not super prepared for, 
for what you're talking about. They've got a couple of notes, and you're going to discuss it. But like in print, when they're, they're stretched pretty thin. They, yeah. they, the staff there uh, again, also some really great people uh, on I and agree. off camera. Yeah. But you know, they have. Uh, the, I think the staff is probably about a third of what it was when I was there at the peak, and they're doing more hours of TV. And again, back to my point earlier, right? You can do that. And because there's no one else is doing anything better, no one, they're not going to be any worse than everybody else. But it does not put your on-air talent in the bed. You can bring the best people you want on TV. But if, if they're there solo or they're with, there with three or four producers uh, doing an hour, you know, if, if, the, if Good Morning America has hundreds of people for the, what, two or three hours that they do, hundreds and hundreds of people. Yeah. A Bloomberg TV show for an hour of TV. And that's just for makeup. Three or four. <laughs> yeah. Well, they needed that much for makeup for me. This carries back from the beginning. Do you remember Jim Sterngold that worked at Bloomberg in print? No, I don't know. We had blown up a chicken farming company, whatever, that was just a total China fraud, right? Which one? Uh, Yui. Uh, do you remember Yuhei? I don't. Yeah. It was a Chinese one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, China, it was Chinese reverse merger. RTO. Of course. Of course. Yeah, okay. Of course. Yeah, well, it was sh I, I like to think I was a really good short seller, but that stuff really was shooting fish in a barrel. At a certain point in time, but it was maybe our third one. And, uh, you know, so he comes out and, and does a story. And it's like three days he spends with us in background and whatever. When he was at the Journal? He was at Bloomberg. Okay. I don't even and, remember at Bloomberg. And, you know, my background, I was, I was a senior executive at publicly traded company, right? And it happened to be a jewelry company, whatever. And the article comes out and it's... I was a jewelry counter manager oh, or something that's like that. Oh, your plum gold guy. Yeah. That, that, <laughs> and, I, and I call this guy up and he's like, wasn't that story great? I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so I really pressed him on it. And it was the editor. He's like, well, look, they don't know who you guys are. They don't know anything about these short activism thing. And they really had me play down the background. I really hate it here. I have to get out of here. I used to be somebody. Oh. I worked for the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. They're killing me. He left within a month. And I, I, I don't know the guy. I'm, uh, I'll, I'll say is when I looked at his LinkedIn resume, Bloomberg's not on there. <laughs> but but it's a pretty impressive resume when you go back from years like, you know, the Journal, Times, whatever. Like it wasn't wasn't nothing. Yeah. I um, The story of what short sellers do is is a. Uh, poorly understood um, in the ranks of serious business journalism. Uh, and it's a great frustration to me. It was a frustration to me, frustration to me when I was a reporter, and it sure as hell was a frustration to me when I was a portfolio manager, especially on the short side. I would have this experience, experience when I was working um, as a money manager where I would encounter something like, oh my God, these guys are completely making up the numbers. Yeah. Or, hey, this is really interesting fraud. And I would go to my, for my friends, my former colleagues, and say, hey, I don't really share stories of what I do. It doesn't really help my investments. But this one's just amazing. You got to look at this. And they're like, is it about Google or Yahoo? I only cover Google and Yahoo. <laughs> right. right. That's what a New York Times reporter said to me once. A guy that I'd worked with, a guy I thought was a great journalist. Um, it was well, it was just amazing the what uh, the the lack of interest in the companies that they haven't heard of. That's another thing I'm trying to address in the drill down every day. We you know there are uh, ten thousand companies with market caps of greater than, what, $250, $500 million, traded on U.S. exchanges, U.S. companies. And By the time you do media, the over-the-counter, yes. Uh, mainstream media covers 30 of them? Yeah. You want to tell me it's 60, 50, 100? I, I mean, listen, you have, you have frauds that are 10, 20, $30 billion market cap companies. Well, those are, those are I'll say those are hard to, hard to find. Are they? Right. Yeah, I mean, they th they're hard to bring down because, like, nobody cares. You get into, you know, the China education companies and uh, of last year that were were going up, and nobody seemed to care. And then there's the short but the squeezes. Stories that are happen. great. That's the problem, right? They're looking at the stock price. They're right. watching the TV, and they're thinking, "Well, I've never heard of Cellsci Corp. I've never heard of App Harvest. I've never heard of Intellia Therapeutics. I've never heard of, you know, Calamp." They're, they're, you know, these are these are fire. Eye, I'm looking. I'm looking at the, the list of, of the companies we've covered in the last four or five days in the drill down. Right. Yeah. 
Express, great story, fascinating story. Nike, we've all heard of. So you know, that's the other thing. They over kind of overweight. Plug Power. Brands you covered Plug Power things. too, which was which was a battleground stock for a while. Plug Power, interesting company. It interesting is. CEO. Uh, fascinating company. Um, Critio, fascinating company in ad in ad technology that in, that impacts that directly impacts all of us on the interwebs. But it would take actually five minutes for someone at, at Bloomberg, CNBC, Wall Street, you know, the editors to actually think about what the company is and actually spend maybe, God forbid, devote a half an hour to understanding how ad technology works, right? Yeah. This is a big issue. This is a big issue right now, right, where we've got um, judges, federal judges saying you can't pursue Facebook for antitrust because they don't charge for their product, uh, which is the essence of the Facebook argument, right? Because they don't charge, so you can't say that, that they, they, they do hurt charge. the prices of their competitors. I, I would disagree with that, but I'm not a judge. I, you know, well, but that's the point, right? Is that we don't have business literacy. There's all this conversation about financial literacy. We don't have business literacy. Business is selling shit for more than it costs. That's it. That's business. You, we don't have business literacy. Wait till you get sued and you're counting on a judge to have business literacy. I'm waiting. I would like to continue to wait. Yeah, Please. Yeah, well, I can send you one of mine if you like. I've got I've got lawyers and insurance galore, but I would just they're all the same. And you actually have the background because you were you worked for a, a short research firm. I mean, a, a short hedge fund, a very uh, well also known one. Uh, I worked for Kingsford Capital for a while. I worked for yeah. forensic research, uh, a company I helped put together with a terrific investigator and. Uh, um, not a short seller, just a short researcher. Um, yeah, I've, 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 I have put um, more to the point. I have been responsible for hundreds of millions of dollars at risk. When uh, I was at Kingsford Capital, I think we were the second largest short fund in the country, yeah. second only to Jim Chanos. Um, and uh, Mike Wilkins is just a phenomenal human being. I mean, I love Mike Wilkins. And Mike is great. Uh, Mike is at Kingsford Capital. He's uh, the 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 head honcho at my, Kingsford Capital, and I, th to my mind. He is the greatest investigator of um, fraudulent business practices in the world. Amazing. Uh, I lo much love to my friend Jim Chanos. Mike's the best. Um, I don't know that Jim would argue with that. I mean, but he's a pretty humble guy to begin with as well. And, and so is Mike. Sort of. Sort of. Uh, <laughs> well, I love both of those. Look, at a, a certain point. Him. <laughs> At a certain point, when you walk in a room with a hedge fund manager, if in the, even if the room is Madison Square Garden, he thinks he's the smartest one in the room. Well, I mean, look, I mean, if you want to start and a so fight, do you. if you want to start, a, no, I don't. No, I, 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 so I, 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 I have to prepare more than the smartest guys in the room. Because and I, I said I'm he because it's usually him's. You know, if you want to start a fight with one of those guys, then then that comes out. But, and I hesitate to even bring up mike wilkins name because he's so private and it's so like it's years later you figure stuff out about him that that you think you know him and you're a friend i mean you worked there you'd know that he's a part owner of the golden state warriors and that's just kind of an oh by the way and of course he'll throw in i don't own as much as chamath does <laughs> okay fine and you know he was a comedy writer to begin with really I, you probably know that right so let's bring this full circle. I said log rolling in our time. That was a regular feature in Spy Magazine in the 80s when we would find someone review a book, of, well, one writer would review a book of another writer, and then that writer would review the other writer's book, and they would work, or they would run the um, obsequious quotes between the two of them. That was, that was a column they called log rolling in our time. Mike Wilkins was a writer for Spy Magazine. No way. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I loved Spy Magazine. That was so funny. No, it... Somebody's like, well, you know, you, it, it, it's, you know, you're, you're investigating all of these crimes and fraud and it's depressing. And, and he was a comedy writer. Can you believe that? And I was like, yeah, I can believe that. Have you ever met a comedian? They're the most unhappy people in the world. <laughs> I used to play a pickup basketball game in Manhattan that was a, it was mostly sports writers, which is how I got into it. But it had, prior to that, it had been comedians. So every once in a while, Bill, Bill Merrill would show up or some comedian those guys, Bill fouled. Moore would show up to play basketball. They called fouls all the time. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They were so aggressive and so pissed off. And they were just getting ready to go to work when we were all kind of wrapping up our day. It was a nighttime game. Yeah. You talk to them and they're like, yeah, my show sucks. My routine sucks. I'm terrible. This sucks. I mean, like, I met Ray Romano right before Everybody Loves Raymond, right yeah. before that came out. And he was talking about a sitcom that 
probably wasn't going to get picked up because he sucks and because nothing he does is any good. (laughs) And the next year, I mean, or six months later, it becomes everybody everybody loves loves Raymond. Everybody loves him. Yeah. Yeah. So not like everybody hates Chris, which was also good. Uh, Let me throw one last Wilkins thing to you because this is a public piece of information. I, last week, I was at a museum that features a piece of art by Mike Wilkins. Can you fucking believe this guy? Do you know what museum it is? The Google Museum of Modern Art? The Smithsonian. What? Oh, my God. <laughs> right. So you're the world's greatest fraud investigator, a terrific guy. Yeah. Um, just like a real mensch, and, yes, also a, 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 a fantastic artist. He's got a wonderful piece called Preamble uh, at, the, at the Smithsonian, and Preamble has license plates, actual license plates from all the states uh, that spells out phonetically we the people of the United States and goes on with the preamble of the Constitution. That's really, cool. I'm gonna have to get yeah. one of those. But write that down, Carl. Preamble. So, so you can do something today. There you go. Well, so getting back to Corey, Corey has, has done it all. So you've been a writer. He helped start the street.com or as part of the, the, the founding group there. The SEC filing said I was the founding reporter. Wow. It's kind of like being a founding father, but without the funny hats. No, yeah, <laughs> I, bet you, I bet you wore funny hats. You're not kidding us. So you you worked at short side research firms. You went into a media editor at large at Bloomberg, you know, my favorite job. And then you got into Bitcoin for a while as well, just to round it all out. So, you so know, clear, it was crypto, not Bitcoin. Oh, I see. It's Ripple's crypto. technology is based on a, a different kind of crypto called XRP. The principal difference between the two is that Bitcoin is is proof of work, which is to say there's lots of computer calculations required for the mining of every coin. Proof of stake is the technology behind XRP, which just proves that the thing is real. Here's my issue with Bitcoin, and hopefully you can help people with this on the drill down as you're having guests on there. Every person I have come and talk about Bitcoin, whether it's XRP or anything else, is like, this is the one you need to own. It's Ethereum. It's Bitcoin. It's you know BSV, XRP, sure, or XRP. Everything else is shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we have in in the world of crypto. I'm going to throw myself into we. I usually throw myself into we and we short sellers. We crypto people. We crypto people um, like to refer to them as maximalists. So there's Bitcoin maximalists. There's XRP maximalists. There's Ether maximalists. There's nothing else in the world. Right. Right. I, that one. It, well, that's that's that tends to be what we attract. And I'm just like, you know, can I get somebody that that can ex- explain the whole universe? And I'm going to do that show. Maybe you can point that guy out to me and I'll uh, <laughs> I'll have him on. Yeah. From there, we're, we're to the drill down. You've talked about that. You're running your own firm, which I guess is based upon music. Estropy, epistrophe. epistrophe epistrophe is that uh, is that jazz or or is that just based on a turn of phrase over and over again the first ever bebop song written by Thelonious Monk called epistrophe there you go and it's epistrophe because bebop is the same words and phrases over and over again I guess right uh, it's 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 the the fount of it's it's a it's a platform for creation it's, it's, it's the basis that lets you improvise and, and figure new things out every time you do it. I'm going to start a fund called Give Me Your Money. Just like straight up, like just right at you. Do you know this uh, terrific website called Koyfin? No. K-O-Y-F-I-N. It's a free website that has terrific equity insights. All right. It's not Bloomberg, but it's damn close for free. And I called up the, I got a hold of the CEO and I was like, hey, Rob, what's your, I don't want to talk out of school, but what's your business model? Like, how does this work? You've got this terrific site. You've got all this data. This can't, you know, it's got to be expensive. I know. He's like, oh, my model. So I have got all these venture capitalists. They give me money and then I spend it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, it's fantastic. It's either that or Soren's favorite fund, Charybdis. Oh, yes. Okay, so what what parting thoughts do you have for us, Corey? I mean, what have we not covered that we need to know that is going to help us get through the rest of this year into next year? The, the learning part of the podcast. Yeah, yeah, we got to learn something, Corey. <laughs> oh, geez, now you tell me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I um, I don't know. I, uh, I this is a really interesting time in the market. It's a really interesting time in the economy. You know, we're really seeing how much uh, the Fed can put the gas to the the pedal of the metal. 
and what the results will be. We're seeing the inflation that uh, very few Americans, transitory, the Corey, population, it's transitory. have ever seen. It's transitory. Right? They, now, well, the, the numbers aren't huge yet, but the the change is massive, and and you know we'll see if that genie can be put back in the bottle. Um, the the massive federal debt might suggest that maybe the Fed you know, they can reduce the debt by letting inflation run a little bit hotter for a while, but can they tamper it when it happens, right? You look at these complaints to the companies. I, we, we, you know, we listen to conference calls. I listen to probably five, six conference calls every day. We feature two or three of them on the show, three or four every day, um, sound bites from them. A lot of CEOs out there saying, you know, I can't hire workers because there's too much unemployment. No. Well, you could pay them more money, but then we're talking inflation, right? You've right. got the raw materials inflation. Um, you've got the things that aren't being measured with inflation. Well, wait till see what you see what happens with pork prices this year. Well, I actually, how this plays you out. know, I just read today that China's building up their their pork uh, herd, so that maybe that'll come down. I, you know, who who knows what you yeah, read? Yeah, you know how long that takes. Yeah, it takes it, twelve months to eighteen months, right? You can't get it. You can't bring a. You can't make a piglet a, a, a pig. <laughs> I, I don't know what they can do and what they can't do. Actually, they probably could in China. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I'm not, I'm not putting it past them. I don't think inflation is transitory. I think that's all bullshit. To some degree, it's here to stay. With the debt, what they're not addressing is you can't really raise interest rates because we have debt service, and at three percent debt service on thirty trillion dollars, we're paying more in debt service than we are for our military. And I don't know how you explain that one away. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But I don't think that looks pretty good in 2022 and 2023 when they're talking about we're raising interest rates. But maybe we'll have you back on and you you can explain it all to us then. <laughs> um, happy to join you at any time, although me explaining macro is going to be real, a real adventure. Well, we're going to make you do it, Corey. <laughs> Um, well, much more interesting to talk about Thelonious Monk any day of the week. Great. All right. So thanks for joining us, Corey. Where can people find you, Corey? Uh, give us your Twitter handle. Give us your website. Talk to us about the drill down and tell us how to find you. All right. If you're listening to this right now, I want you to do three things. Okay. Well, all three? Okay, just one. All right. <laughs> Go to your favorite podcast platform. I don't care if it's iTunes, Spotify, iHeart, TuneIn, Stitcher, Pandora. Tell your smart speaker. Play the Drill Down podcast. Subscribe to the Drill Down podcast. Listen to the Drill Down podcast. I think you'll like it. If you like this conversation, I think you're going to enjoy the sort of 30 minutes we give you every day on the most important things in the world of business. We're not going to tell you what the stock market did today. We're going to tell you the three most important things in business. I'm going to give you three companies that you can understand better before that, those few minutes are over. And we'll give you 15 to 20 minutes with a CEO so you can really understand in depth one company. You will walk out of this podcast every day learning something about business that you didn't know beforehand. Again, it's a blast to do, and I hope uh, everyone listening gets a chance to hear it. Great. Well, I've done it. You should do it. And if you like our podcast, give us a retweet. Give us a like. If you don't like our podcast, I don't care. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, brother. <laughs>